started. All right, folks, uh, I'm going to mention about three or four words, and then uh, later on I may ask you what was the first thought that came into your mind. And the words are predestinated, chosen, elect, ordained. Those words. Now you don't have to tell me the first thing that popped into your head, especially when you heard the word predestinated. Uh, actually, I'm going to tell you what most people think when they hear that word as we stuck when we come to it. But the first thing I would like to do today, uh, by the way, the title of this today is predestination like you've never heard it before. Uh, is the title of this study. Now, it's probably you may have never heard a teacher teach on the subject of predestination or election or chosen or something like that. And, and it's very likely in this area that you haven't, but we'll try to do our best on it today. But first I want to uh I want to go back a little bit because look what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 1. In the very first verse, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Now, I quickly want to bring out three wills that we find in the Bible. And there's one verse that brings them all together. John chapter 1 and verse 13, if you'll turn there with me. We find all three wills in the Bible here in this one verse. Wow, that's amazing, ain't it? There is the uh, there is the will of the flesh. There is the will of man, and there's the will of God. Now, in this verse, we're talking about being born again, and this verse eliminates the will of man and the will of the flesh, and it says we're born again only by the will of God. Let's read the verse which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, if we just think about that logically, it don't make much sense because we know what happened when during our conversion experience. We know that we decided one night when we heard the gospel that we were going to be saved. We did that of our own free will. So why does it say we were born again by the will of God, but on the night we were saved, our free will had something to do with it? So how do we reconcile those two things? We have God borning us again by His will, but in, in our reality, in our real-time experiences, it's by our will that we were saved. So how do we reconcile those things? Well, if you think back to the time you were converted, everyone that I've heard give a testimony says this, When the Holy Spirit convicted my heart, that's when I wanted to be saved. Now, here's the thing. Our wills are, are influenced by our nature. Okay? Before we're born again, and before God sent the Holy Spirit to convict our heart, we literally had no desire to be saved. I mean, you go in the woods and you tell somebody they're lost, but they're really not lost. They're probably going to shoot you. So you have to realize you're lost before you will even have the desire to be saved. And that comes into play when the Holy Spirit comes to the heart and convicts a soul. So before the Holy Spirit convicted us, there was no desire whatsoever to be saved. Matter of fact, the Bible describes the lost person as all we like sheep have gone astray. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible speaks of us not having any ability to come to the Lord. So in a very real sense, 
we cannot even come to the Lord unless the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts. And here's the reason why. Part of salvation is repentance. And without a genuine heartfelt realization of the condition you are in as a lost person, and that is a wretched, miserable condition, by the way. Nobody should ever be going to the altar to be saved smiling. That should never happen. Because when you realize the, the awful predicament you're in, you're going to do like the public and you're going to cry out, be merciful to me, a sinner. So God, when it says by the will of God we're born again, and we understand that our nature, our desire to be saved changed when the Holy Spirit convicted our hearts, now we can better understand how that we're born by the will of God, can't we? It's, a, it's better understood when we understand it that way. Now when we deal with the Bible... And when we deal with God and ourselves, if we keep two things in mind, it will save us a lot of trouble when we're trying to figure out Scripture. And when we keep in mind that God operates in the infinite realm, in other words, time, space, and matter does not matter to Him. But we operate in the finite realm. So we are limited by time, space, and matter, whereas God is not. That's why God, the Holy Spirit, can write Isaiah 53, 700 years before the events in Isaiah 53 happened, as if they happened in the past. Because time means nothing to God. Now, when we start talking about predestined, chosen, elect, ordained, we need to think about it in God's terms, not in ours. Because here's, ha here's what happens. If we try to bring God down into our realm and make God operate according to our rules, it's not going to work. Because God said in the Word, my ways are as high from your ways as the heavens are the earth. So we need to keep that in mind when we start studying this word or these words. Uh, and the words predestined, chosen, elect, ordained, they essentially are talking about the same thing when, when we talk about them in the Bible. Uh, ordained is about the same as electing. When they, or, when they have an ordination service and they ordain someone, they're choosing someone beforehand. Uh, they're electing them to be a part of a group. So with that in mind, let's start with uh, our study. Now what we'll notice in chapter 1 of Ephesians is it is a chapter that is all about the sovereignty of God. Now, that word R-E-I-G-N is in that word sovereign. And the word sov means alone. It's akin to alone. So it literally means that God alone reigns when we talk about the sovereignty of God. Now, here's the question. Does God reign in only some things or does He reign in everything? Now, if He reigns in everything, if God, because He is sovereign, is in control of everything, then we can look around in the world that we live in and the seeming chaos and evil, and we know when we give praise to a sovereign God that it's all working out according to His plans and purposes. And I don't know about you, but that gives me great relief knowing that God has this thing in control. It, it keeps me from going out and, and expelling all this energy 
trying to make the world into Christians. You know, that's been tried before. A th- theocracies have been tried on the earth before, and the results were horrific. The Roman Catholic Church tried it. They tried to merge the government and the church, and the results were horrific because... The church usurped the authority of the government and people were targeted and died as a result of it. If you've ever heard of the Roman and the Spanish Inquisitions, the Jewish libels, all those things that came under the Roman Catholic Church. The way things are going to work out are exactly the way the Bible says they're going to work out. Now, if you ask me for details and you demand details, I'm not going to be able to give them to you. But I can tell you, read the Bible, it's in there. So when we're talking about Ephesians 1, we are keeping in mind that we're talking about a sovereign God. Paul even starts out by the will of God here. Now, let's go down to uh, verse 4 and we're going to have, have our first word that we're going to talk about in depth today. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Now, you don't have to tell me, but I can promise you the majority of people that teach and preach the Bible When they see this phrase, they immediately think about one word, and that one word is Calvinism. Because here's the thing, when you listen to Calvinists, they they are always quoting this verse right here. But on the other side of the camp, they, they never quote this verse. And why? For fear of being labeled a Calvinist. That's why. For fear of being labeled into a group. Most people, to avoid the controversy, simply never talk about the subject. When it comes to Scripture, there's four options. Accept it, reject it, ignore it, or redefine it. Now, when it comes to the subject predestination, most people ignore it. I I never in all my years when I was growing up never heard the first word about predestination. Now likely if you hear someone talking about it in our area it will be talked about in negative terms such as well that's one of those Calvinistic doctrines. But actually the Bible talked about predestination before Calvin was ever born so the Bible speaks about the subject and if the Bible speaks about predestination chosen, elect ordained, then we should talk about it now what I want to do as a Bible teacher today from here out when you read this verse that we just read, let's read it again according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, I don't want you to think immediately of John Calvin, but I want you to think immediately of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. So let's go and let's read about Mephibosheth and let's see what kind of great truths we can glean from that. Because in a very real sense, Think about what happened with Mephibosheth. He was crippled. We were. He was in a place called Lodibar. And that means literally nothingville. Nothingville. How many of you all are from a place that could be called Nothingville? Every one of us. You know why? We live in flyover country. Every last one of us. So the world, when they think about you and I, they just sneer 
and they move on with their lives. We're in flyover country. Literally, by the way, has anybody seen those big planes that have been practicing their maneuvers about cutting the tops of trees off? And you'll be driving up the road and all of a sudden there's this big, huge, like C-10 coming over the trees, about cutting the trees off. And you're thinking, well, are they about to crash? No, they're practicing in flyover country is what they're doing. So to, to the majority of the world today, you and I are live in nothingville, okay? So Mephibosheth came from nothingville, but we'll get into that more as we read about him. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And let's read about him. <clears throat> Mephibosheth. Y'all probably find it before I do. It's before Kings. Got 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, then 1 Kings. 2 Samuel chapter 9. <clears throat> now the very first verse, David asks a question. Now keep in mind, he does not even know at this point if there's anyone left of the house of Jonathan. So he asks, Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, right here we have a lot of biblical theology in this one verse. Number one, David who represents God started looking for Mephibosheth before Mephibosheth ever thought about looking for David. Matter of fact, if Mephibosheth would have thought about David, the first thought that would have come to Mephibosheth's mind would have been absolute terror and fear. Here's why. It was common practice when one king left and another king took over that they would kill all the potential heirs of that king's family. So the reason Mephibosheth was living in Lodibar is probably because he would be left alone there. Left alone. And you know what? What is the most of the world if they could tell God something, you know what they would tell Him? Leave me alone. But you know what? God does not leave His chosen alone. He didn't leave Paul alone. Paul was literally wanting to kill every Christian he could find and get rid of this Jesus thing once and for all. But you know what? When Paul was antagonistic against the church in Christ, God was seeking him out. And God intercepted him on the road to Damascus. I like to think about salvation in those terms. God intercepting a man who is head set on going to hell and God changes their mind and they get saved and they live from that moment on till the day they die for the Lord. What a description of salvation that is. I, I refer to it in, as another way, spiritually body slammed that God did Paul. He literally bit, hit the ground when, when he came under that conviction. So number one, so let's read on. And then in verse 2 and 3 and, and verse 4, they tell him of Mephibosheth. And they tell him that the condition of Mephibosheth is in. He was crippled. Now can you imagine... Some of David's captains saying, Well, you don't need this old crippled fella. Look at us. 
we're, we're all mighty men and you want to bring this crippled fellow in and we're going to have to spend our time taking care of him from now on. Well, David, we're supposed to be out fighting for you and, and doing all these things and now we're going to have to spend our time taking care of a crippled boy. And you know what David said? Would have said at that point, Yes, that's exactly what I expect you to do because I've chosen him to come and be with me and he will be taken care of. So the story is that, look, verse 5, Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machor, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. That means nothingville. From nothing. So, Mephibosheth, in a very real sense, went from nothing to everything. Why? Not because of Mephibosheth, but because David, who represents God, chose Mephibosheth to be with him, not because of Mephibosheth or anything he did, but because of Jonathan. So Jonathan in this story is the picture of Christ. David said, for Jonathan's sake. Now, when we go to Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read that everything we did get is because of Christ. All those heavenly blessings, spiritual blessings in heavenly places is because of Christ. So the story comes, he comes in. Now look what Mephibosheth said. Let's see, oh, right here, verse 8, I believe, is where Mephibosheth. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. You know what? Mephibosheth there in Lodabar was content to live out his miserable life till the day he died as a targeted man. He felt like he was a targeted man. He had the death sentence upon him at all times. This confession here reveals that fact that Mephibosheth lived under the conviction that at any time King David could find me and literally kill me. Now can you imagine a messenger coming to Lodibar and saying, Message from King David to Mephibosheth. Where are you, Mephibosheth? What would you have thought if you were Mephibosheth? I'm dead. They finally found me. But can you imagine that servant is the form of the Holy Spirit in this story that we were talking about. So David predestined Mephibosheth to come and be at his table before Mephibosheth even knew anything about it. He chose him to be one of his. And he sent the servant out which represents the Holy Spirit. Remember we talked about the Holy Spirit changing our wills so that we could be saved. Without the Holy Spirit intervening in a lost person's life it's impossible to be saved. We can try to do it without repentance, but the results of that are horrific. The evangelical crusades, the statistics coming from that show that over 75% really did not get saved. We tried to do it without the repentance and without the Holy Spirit. So he comes there and he says, I'm a dead dog. Why did you even bring me here? Call himself uh, lower than anything yes. called yeah. in the Hebrew time. Yes. A dog was a, a disgrace. Yeah. And you know what? 
when we come to the point that we're under conviction, we will realize just how awful we are. We are, yes, that's right. So, going over this, let Mephibosheth was chosen to go and spend his, the rest of his days in joy and peace. Because David chose him on because of Jonathan's sake, for Jonathan's sake. And you know what? If we have the idea that God chose us because we did something wonderful sometime, we did choose God of our own free will when we were saved. But if we get lifted up in pride and say, Oh, because I went and was baptizing, because I got saved in this church under this preacher, if we get lifted up in pride, we would do well to remember that we got saved because the Holy Spirit convicted our hearts. That's how we got saved. Why we did. So David chose, ordained, predestined Mephibosheth to be his own before knowing anything about Mephibosheth. Think about that. And certainly Mephibosheth did not know anything about David and did not want any relationship with David because his relationship to David before the servant came in a very real sense was only of facing the death penalty. That's the only thing Mephibosheth could look forward to in relation to King David. And you know what? A lost person until the Holy Spirit convicts their heart, they are living their lives under a constant death sentence penalty. A lost person don't think about this. If they did, they would, this house would be full. But you are, every breath you take, you're, you're taking it under the death penalty. And when you die lost, you're under the wrath, you die under the wrath of God. And the next thing you face is the great white throne judgment where you say, here say, depart from me. But if the lost people would contemplate that, the house would be full. But they won't contemplate that and the reason why we went over it. Their wills have not been changed because of the Holy Spirit, the servant coming to convict them. That's why. So Mephibosheth was chosen in spite of the accusations. He was chosen as he was with his defects and all. God chooses us just the way we are. But we don't stay the way we are, do we? Mephibosheth didn't stay the way he was, ragged clothes, starved half to death, scared to death all the time. No, 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 his entire surroundings changed. Even though he was the same physically and basically, his entire outlook changed. And not only for a day, but it changed forever. See, when we get saved... We get the whole package at one time. Matter of fact, the, the moment David said, Is there any of the house of Jonathan that I can rescue? At that moment, Mephibosheth's destiny was sealed already. He was destined to come back and be with, the, with, the, with David for the rest of his life. So now... When we think about being chosen of God and we think about it in the terms of Mephibosheth instead of it bringing great distress to us it brings a feeling of great blessing, don't it? When we think about that. So he was chosen out of nothing into everything. He was chosen to restoration and continual promised fellowship with David. Wow. 
Once you're chosen, you're chosen for good. It was that way with David. And it was that way with Jesus and his disciples. In, in, uh, in John chapter 13, the Bible says, Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. Now, if you read about what the disciples did, they all forsook him and fled. That verse will be a great blessing to you. So in spite of what they did, he kept loving them. They were Mephibosheth was chosen in spite of being a problem. He was lame. Now, I'm going to finish up real quick. Now the last part of this verse says, verse 4, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, but it don't stop there. God don't just choose us and say, Oh, I'm going to set you on a shelf and look at you and see how pretty you are all through your life. No, God chooses us and it says here that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So when you're chosen of God, you're chosen to work for Him, to be holy for Him, to be without blame, to be light in a dark world. Next week, we will continue the study and we will be talking about more about being predestinated. Predestinated. I don't know if you've heard that term or heard anybody talk about it before, but we're going to hear why. Because the Bible talks about it. So we'll probably do a second part next Sunday.